Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Watson, and to uh, certainly the President, Pat McGuire, and uh, Provost uh, Dr. Campo, Dean Peggy Lewis, and all of you that have come out tonight. Let me acknowledge the presence of Cleola Brown, who is the president of A. Philip Randolph Institute, one of our major leaders. One of our, <clears throat> one of our major leaders in the country. And then uh, Talik stand up. He's on staff at National Action Network in Washington, young minister, and uh, doing a fine job with us and Nan, and then, uh, of course, Sister who heads our uh, chapter here in Washington, D.C. And I, I was laughing, I was laughing when uh, Dr. Watson was saying, I get up at four now, he sleeps an hour later because I work out in the mornings, but I was laughing because Chris Ford, who travels with me, does not get to sleep late because he has to get up when I get up though he doesn't work out every morning, he has to watch me work out every morning. So he doesn't get much sleep. Uh, and let me say I'm happy to be on campus of uh, someone that I think has distinguished themselves in uh, American history, and that's uh, one of your alumni, Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi. And of course, you have many distinguished alumni, Maggie Williams, who I knew well, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Kelly Ann Conway. Every institution has mistakes every now and then. <laughs> I'll get back to her in a minute, but anyway. Uh, as stated, I, I came, I was in Las Vegas last night for the uh, Democratic debate. And one of the things that I think that is interesting is that people know what we're looking at in a contemporary setting. But if you don't apply the history to where we got to where we are, you will misread where we are. So a lot of us are very adept to uh, understand what is going on today. But today is really part of an ongoing journey this country has had. And if you put the present era in the context of American history, then you will look at where we are and act where we are differently. When this country was formed, this is Black History Month, when this country was formed, it was formed as where both racism and sexism was normal. And the struggle against both has been since the inception of the country. You must remember the founding fathers felt that only white male men should be able to vote and should be able to own property. That was the basis of the country. So when we talk about uh, the great republic of the United States, all men created equal and, uh, uh, and, and endowed by God with rights, they were not talking about all men as we talk about all men. Because we talk about all men like that includes women, like that includes blacks and Latinos and Asians. They were not talking about that. So the struggle has been from the beginning a struggle to make America live up to a broader meaning of its own creed, uh, which is the challenge that we are facing today even in this election. There's always been the struggle between those that wanted to keep it where it was and those that wanted to expand it or change it to where it ought to be. And that didn't start in the 2020 election. Uh, and uh, or any of the elections before that. If you understand that, you would understand that uh, Donald Trump is not a aberration. He in many ways is a continuation. The question is whether there will be a continuation of Virginia in the House, I didn't see you. Whether there'll be a continuation of the struggle on the other side. 
And inside of the struggle has always been struggles. Cleo can tell you because as we've struggled against racism and sexism, there's been those in the struggle for racism that were misogynists themselves. So you had the double whammy if you were a black woman to have to fight racism and sexism from black men. And I think that if we understand that context, when the country started, ironically, the first one to die in the American Revolution was a black man named Crispus Attucks. Died for a revolution that by law and custom at that time, delegated him to being less than human. There was the act of slave trade. And the only way you could justify the economic arrangement of slavery is you had to dehumanize who you were enslaving. So from the beginning, there was an economic underpinning and an economic end goal to slavery. Slavery wasn't just that they didn't like Africans. Slavery was also is that there's very, it's very difficult not to become rich if your workforce doesn't have to be paid. So it, it, it is an economic thing. I'm going to build an economy on cotton and tobacco and other elements, and I'm going to get a labor force that will work the fields, produce the product, and I don't have to pay them. So if I could go downtown now and open up any business and build the business and not have to pay the workers, I would get very wealthy very quickly. And that was the basis, that was the socioeconomic premise the country started on. How they justified it by, was by saying, well, blacks are less than human. And even at one point said we were basically three-fifths of a human. And women were less than men, that God made women to be the helpmate of men. And they would get the theological proponents of the time to actually preach that like it was biblical. They take a half of a, a, a verse of a scripture and say, obey your uh, uh, masters, totally out of context, and use that to justify slavery. The Bible said, obey your masters. Well, the Bible wouldn't talk about obey your masters in an Alabama plantation. But the interpretation is that, like you have some that are around today that justify things from a biblical point of view, which is why we have the present occupant in the White House. The good news, though, was there was always those that would challenge that. From the beginning, there was an anti-slavery movement, and there was a movement around giving women their equal rights. And that resistance movement even among the founding fathers was responded to differently. Uh, there's a, a new book that just came out on George Washington, where Washington had some contrition about slavery, though he owned slaves himself. And though he didn't have the courage to stand up to his colleagues, he had it written in his will, his slaves would be free upon his death, which meant he going to strike a blow for freedom when nobody could respond. This is the father of the nation. All the way until we get to the uh, 18th uh, hundreds or the, or the 19th century, where there was the division in the country on the question of the North and the South, the fight between Northern industrialists and the Southern agricultural czars on who was going to dictate trade and dictate how we deal with tariffs, many of the things that we are dealing with at a different level today. The way to break the Southern aristocracy was to take away their workforce. So if I'm in the North and I wanted to win and I wanted to break the guys in the South, if I could take away their workforce that was working for nothing, it would bring down their power. So the fight began 
dividing the North and the South around an economic battle. And the fight to free the slaves had nothing to do with some of them around humanitarianism. It was around they wanting to crush the Southern aristocracy's grip on the economy. We became the ball in the middle of a ping pong match between the North and the South. As the South rose up and went and developed what is, became known throughout American history as states' rights, their rebellion was, first of all, the North can't tell us what to do. Mississippi will decide for Mississippi. Alabama will decide for Alabama, South Carolina, so forth and on. And the states' rights movement began and formed as a confederacy of confederate states. And they actually formed their own government. And Stonewall Jackson became the president, and Jefferson Davis and others. And as they fought to have the confederate states to save the union, Abraham Lincoln became president and, and fought to save the union. Now, Lincoln was a reluctant uh, fighter for the freedom of the slaves, which is another myth we have in American history. Many of us are led to believe, when I was growing up, we were taught that Lincoln was the great emancipator. And in many ways, he reluctantly got there. Lincoln himself never really embraced the equality of blacks. Lincoln really was one that was saying they should, well, let's, he tried several things. Let's send them back to Liberia, to Africa, or let's give them some kind of subjected uh, view. But Lincoln, because the Civil War engaged so much manpower, and the Southern Confederate states had built such a military, they had gotten as far north as Virginia. The abolitionist movement had been advocating all along to free slaves. Others were saying to Lincoln, you've got to free the slaves and have them join the Union Army. If not, we're going to be defeated. He would not hear that. Among those was Frederick Douglass. He would not do that. When they got as far north as Virginia, which is not far from Washington, D.C., and they were afraid of being overtaken, Lincoln freed the slaves only in the southern states. He did not free the slaves in the north. And he freed the slaves in the southern states, allowed them to join the Union Army, and those former slaves backed the Confederate Army back with the Union Army and defeated them, and the Civil War was won, which is why, in real terms, Lincoln didn't free the slaves, the slaves freed Lincoln. Because had they not joined the Union Army, the Confederates might have won the Civil War, and American history would have gone differently. Lincoln, in freeing the Southern slaves, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and the Emancipation Proclamation, in effect, said that as of January 1st, 1863, slaves would be free. And they would be promised full citizenship. That was the promise. That's why 100 years later, a lot of, again, context, 100 years later, 1863 to 1963, they had the 1963 March on Washington, which was called for and organized by A. Philip Randolph, the institute she heads. It was not called by Dr. King. Dr. King was one of the speakers. Randolph called the march because Randolph could get labor, the unions and others, to come. That's how they got 250,000 people to Washington. There was not 250,000 Baptist preachers that got them people to Washington, though we take the credit in history. <laughs> it was labor called by uh, Randolph, who was in his 70s at the time. And King became the closing speaker, and that's where the great speech, I Have a Dream, came from. But if you read the whole speech, you would understand the historic context that I left you with in 1863. And that is, first of all, why did they go to Lincoln Memorial? Most of you know the March on Washington 63 that you read about 
uh, was at Lincoln Memorial. Why didn't they go to the Washington Monument? Why didn't they go to the Jefferson Memorial? They went to the Lincoln Memorial because if you read King's speech, he said, Mr. Lincoln, you promised that we'd have equal rights. You promised we'd have the right to vote. Washington didn't promise that. Jefferson didn't promise, so they went to Lincoln to say we come 100 years later to fulfill the promises that had not been kept. And in fact, he said that America gave the Negro, that was, we, that was the term then, we gave the Negro a check that has bounced in the bank of justice. That part is not given a lot. They talk about the end of the speech. Any of you that grew up or been to a black church, the closing of a sermon is not the meat of the sermon. You get the basic content and message in the meat of the sermon. You get the, you know, exhilaration at the end and everybody leaves in a state of ecstasy. But <laughs> if all you get is that, then you don't have the meat and the content of which to live and build your character. The I have a dream part that everyone quotes was the climax of the message. That was not the message. The message was the canceled check or the un, uh, uh, unredeemable check or the bad check. He said it bounced in the, in the bank of justice, standing in the shadows of Lincoln's memorial. So there was a direct line from 1863 to 1963. Lincoln was killed, 1863, assassinated by a Confederate sympathizer, John Wilkes Booth. And he was replaced, of course, the vice president by Lord Johnson. And many of the things built into reconstruction, giving blacks the right to vote, giving blacks the right to other things that they had been excluded from. In that context, blacks got 22 members of Congress, two members of the US Senate, and began to build and empower themselves. There immediately became a backlash to that. And the backlash started with Ku Klux Klan, White Citizens Council, terrorist groups. But what cemented the backlash was not just the white supremacist in the white robes, it was the white supremacist in the black robes, Supreme Court, that began making decisions that would reverse a lot of the gains and promises that had became law. We had gotten the 14th, 15th Amendment, we had the right to vote, we had equal rights, all of that, and they began to rebel against that. And again, the same as I said in the time of George Washington, there was this battle, states' rights, deny their rights against a national, strong, united states, a union that would have law that would supersede every state's customs. That was what the Civil War was about. That was the backlash that came after Reconstruction. They were fighting for states' rights. Alabama will decide on what the voting laws would be for Alabama. Mississippi would decide the voting laws for Mississippi and on and on. And it was this battle between whether we would have federal government that would supersede and control all of that or whether each state would decide separately what they would do. That was that battle went all the way into the beginning of the 20th century. And they began having the terrorist groups operate with no kind of accountability and they would actually start lynching blacks. Lynching became so customary and rose to such a degree to by the beginning of the 20th century, people started saying we must stop the lynching of blacks. And you gotta remember, these were people that were claiming to be patriots and Christians. They would literally leave church on Sunday, go down to the square of a town and lynch a black while they picnicked and celebrated it and they would like to do it in the town square because if you hung them in the town square, it would give a lesson to the other blacks, this is what can happen to you. 
it was in that climate that in 1906 that there was a group of whites and blacks who was part of that resistance movement that met in Niagara Falls formed the Niagara Movement, which became the NAACP, formed to stop lynching. And right after that, the National Urban League about three years later. All of that was to deal with that climate. Running parallel with that was a women's suffrage movement. And some in the movement against slavery and lynching worked with the women's movement, some didn't. Some in the women's movement worked against the anti, uh, worked with the anti-lynching movement and the black equal rights movement, some didn't. So you had Frederick Douglass that would speak at the women conventions, white women that were fighting for equality. And you had some white women that were racist. So this whole battle that we hear today of intersectionalism didn't start in the 21st century. This was always the case of trying to get people together and trying to get even those that were considered on the center or the left to stop fighting each other. There was the, even on the, uh, uh, on the liberation side, William Lloyd Garrison, who was one of the leading abolitionists, had one of the leading abolitionist journals he and Frederick Douglass fell out. When Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery, went north and uh, worked his way into New England, and he became this runaway slave that became celebrated, and he would speak at gatherings. They would tell him, no, we don't need you to speak. We want you to stand up and be an example of what they do to slaves, because we'll speak for you. And that's something many of us in the struggle have had to deal with in the 21st century, that you have those progressives that think they can speak for us better than we can speak for ourselves. You know, I, I've been involved in struggles, uh, to digress, but I've been involved in struggles where we would go into like Ferguson when Michael Brown was killed by police, and you would turn on the TV at night and they would have people on speaking on behalf of a movement that we never saw them. I can't tell you how many activists I saw on TV that was involved in Eric Garner that never was involved. But they get their friends to interpret us, and they all of a sudden become the leaders of us, which is why they fade in a year or two. And, and in your generation, it's easier because of the social media, you can form a hashtag and claim to be anything. And you need hashtag. I'm not against social media, use it myself. But if you are only hashtag deep, you will not change much. <laughs> Hashtags ought to be highlighting something substantive, not be the substance itself. Because if you don't have structure behind it, and can affect the laws and then have those laws enforced, your hashtag will go out as soon as the next popular hashtag comes in. And the danger of that is anyone then can use it. And no one has been a better master of using social media than Donald Trump. Because once anybody believes whatever's on the internet, the wrong person get the internet, they don't believe that too. Which is why he tweets more than he reads policy. You imagine a 73-year-old man in the middle of the night tweeting. <laughs> you gotta wonder, what does he do? Why is he up one o'clock in the morning eating a Big Mac tweeting? <laughs> but I digressed. <laughs> so that movement began in the early part of the 20th century, picking up from where they were in the 19th century. And the fight was get anti-lynching laws, get women right to vote. Women got the right to vote, keep fighting for blacks. It led all the way through the North and the South. There was the bus boycott in Harlem 15 years before the bus boycott in Montgomery. A. Philip Randolph formed a group called the Sleeping Car Porters Union. That was in the North. 
Adam Clayton Powell, who later became a congressman, pastor of a major church, had a Harlem bus boycott 15 years before Dr. King's bus boycott in Montgomery. Well, Reverend Al, I didn't know that. Why don't you know that? Because many of the liberals in the North didn't want to talk about racism in the North. It was easier to talk about those knuckleheads down South than to talk about yourself right in the North. We had the same problems in the New Yorks and the Bostons and, and Rochester and Detroit that we had in Alabama. It was just more manicured, more polished. But it was the same. So in 1944, for example, Adam Crane Powell wrote a book, Marching Blacks, at a term we weren't even using blacks then, talking about the Harlem bus boycott. So by the time you get to Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King said he read Marching Blacks to find out how to do a boycott in Montgomery. Rosa Parks sits down in the front of a bus and refused to give up her seat, and they organized a boycott that went 365 days. They said it was better to walk in dignity than ride in shame. That was based on what they had studied from Gandhi and the Northern Movement. But the thing we miss is that Rosa Parks, and I, I was privileged and honored to have met her two or three times, and I spoke at her funeral. Rosa Parks told me, I was not the only black on the bus that day. When Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, there were several black men in the back of the bus saying, why is she starting all that trouble? And in the, ling the linguistics of the oppressed, that, that, that group that just goes along to get along, that feels that the price for their career advantage is the silence and to compromise their self-esteem. They say, why is she doing all that? And we would come up with all kind of excuses. So I like to ride the back of the bus, back going where the front going. <laughs> if they get in an accident, folk up front gonna get hurt first. <laughs> Justifying cowardice. And this diminutive woman took a seat and was arrested. Remember now, Rosa Parks didn't break custom. She broke the law. A lot of us talk about the Civil Rights Movement like this changed Southern custom. It was the law blacks had to go to the back of the bus. They did not come and teach her etiquette that you're going against Southern custom, Southern tradition. They arrested her. It was the law. And that is what caused the boycott. And the blacks saying, we'll walk rather than ride the bus, or we'll carpool. And they started having rallies every night at different churches. Dr. King, who came from Atlanta, was the son and grandson of prominent ministers, who had a PhD from Boston University at a time the average black was not graduating high school. He had just come to Montgomery. Because of the internal ego battles of the ministers, they, Dr. Ralph Abernathy, who pastored First Baptist Church in Montgomery, said, let us nominate the newcomer, who's very articulate, to be the president, because nobody was against him because he just got to town. Because <laughs> all the guys that been there was fighting over, you ain't going to be the leader, I'm the leader. Some of y'all know that right now. Y'all go through that, I'm sure, on campus. They then made him the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, and history made uh, the rest. He became one of the greatest people in American history. That all came out of that lineage of studying the roots of the struggle and fighting against states' rights. The governor that he ended up having to face off with George Wallace, was of the states' rights movement. Strom Thurmond in South Carolina, states' rights movement that came right out of the pre-Civil War Confederacy. So as you saw that backlash, they started shooting and killing people. 
the voting rights movement started in the South. They were able to fight and get the 64 Civil Rights Act, public accommodations, so blacks could go wherever they wanted in public accommodations, from riding mass transportation to restaurants and hotels and all. That was to desegregate. The, the, the part of the misnomer a lot of, of young people are not given is the movement was never about integration as much as it was desegregation. So you will hear some even in the black community say, well, I ain't in the integration. We don't have to be with anybody. It was not about we felt it was more uh, loyal, I mean, more royal to be with whites. It was if we pay tax, then we should be able to do what anybody else that pay tax do. I should have the right to sit where I want. I should have the right to check in a hotel of my choice. I should have the right to eat in whatever restaurant I want because the taxes that I pay pays for the police that takes care of that restaurant, pays for the lights outside in the street, pays for the sanitation department. So why should I pay? But as you get people that, that became extreme in our community, I don't need integration. I don't need, ain't nothing royal. But it, it was never about that. We never was under the misconception that we sitting on a toilet with whites would somehow make us free. <laughs> it was the right that if I'm going to pay for the toilet, I can use the toilet. They did not give us immunity from taxes. We had to pay the same tax, though we were treated as less human. And went on into fighting then for the right to vote. And as they started fighting for that, it was many whites from the North that came South and helped join the fight. The fight for blacks never was a fight that blacks alone engaged in. There were some young people that were killed, one notably Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner, two Jews and a black, mowed to death in Mississippi with their eyes open. Why were they in Mississippi registering blacks to vote? Lady came from Michigan named Viola Louisa, Italian descent, killed her for coming down to register blacks to vote. Then as they decided to organize in Alabama and march to Montgomery, which was the, like the capital bastion of this resistance and of the states' rights movement, it was on that Sunday morning as they gathered in a little town called Selma and began to march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge that uh, some of you go to every year. And Edmund Pettus was a Ku Klux Klansman, by the way. And they marched across that bridge. That's when the state troopers told them to back up, and they stormed them and beat John Lewis and Hosea Williams and others on that bridge. Dr. King was not even in Selma. Dr. King was in his home, his father's church, preaching that morning. They called and told him what happened, and he came and continued the march. And because of the horrific uh, television coverage of how uh, they were beaten on that bridge. That's when Lyndon Johnson, who had told Dr. King and Mr. Randolph and them, we just got the Civil Rights Act in 64, I can't do voting rights. He said, now I think we can do voting rights under that. Johnson intended to delay that. It was Selma that turned that around. Now, why do I stop at Selma? One, not only is it important for the right to vote, not only is it important to understand that it was people of all races that fought this, it also was where mass media became important because people could then see in their living rooms what had been operating under the shadows. So one of the things that the King movement was very good at was dramatizing and publicizing what was always happening for hundreds of years. We always couldn't vote. But when people saw these people beaten on a bridge in the land of the free, the home of the brave, that's what caused a public reaction. That's why when you hear people today talk about all, all they want is publicity, one of the controversies I've had to deal with all my career is Reverend Al likes to get on tape a lot of publicity. 
And, uh, they, and my critics say, you just like to get publicity. That's exactly right. I hear a lot of people that defend me saying, no, that's not, no, that, don't defend me. That is part of the job. Don't nobody call me to keep a secret. <laughs> they call me because they want public attention. When Trayvon Martin's mother came to me, I had never heard of Trayvon Martin. He'd been dead and buried when she got to me. She came because she wanted us to make it national. There's not going to be outrage if you keep it quiet. And that's what the King Movement did is dramatize what was already there. But no one ever put a spotlight on it. And I learned that as a kid as he read the bio in the Civil Rights Movement. Without a spotlight, people operate any way they want in the dark. Now, I, I, I learned that even before I joined the movement at 13, I learned that growing up in the hood in Brooklyn. I come out of Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I was in, uh, you know, I grew up my, in a single parent home, and uh, we lived in the hood. And I know all of y'all middle class and don't know about these things, but we had, we had roaches. I know y'all don't know nothing about roaches. And I learned, watching roaches about spotlight and organizing. Because I got up one night <laughs> and going to the bathroom, I passed the kitchen and there was roaches all over the kitchen table. And I ran in the bedroom, woke up my sister, and I said, Joy, we got a lot of roaches. She said, leave me. I said, no, we've got roaches. You got to get the spray. I forget, raid was the thing at the time. Oh, somebody been around roaches. <laughs> if you know raid, you know roaches. <laughs> I want to go get the can of raid, because raid smelled awful, but it got the roaches. She got up and uh, stumbled to the kitchen, and I had, had uh, cut the light on, and the roaches had disappeared. And she looked at me and said, what roaches? I said, they were right here. Now, she's really mad now, because I woke up. She goes back and lay down, cut the light off. I laid down. It bothered me. I went back in the kitchen, and the roaches had come back out. I went and got her again, cut the light on, roaches was gone. So I learned way before I met the civil rights leaders that the way you scatter roaches is cut the light on. So whether it is Eric Garner in New York, choked to death by police, or Trayvon in Florida, any of the things you may have seen down through the years I was involved in, my job was to cut the light on. Because when I went to Florida, for example, on George Zimmerman, they wouldn't even arrest Zimmerman until we cut the light on. And then people all over the country said, what do you mean he could kill a guy and not even be tried in court? What do you mean you could choke a guy to death saying I can't breathe and keep your job? Somebody has to put the light on. The first job of an activist is to put the light on situations that have been allowed to continue. If you do not expose it, it will die in the darkness of the moment. Now, you're going to expose yourself by doing it because they, there's going to be the backlash. They're going to call you names. They're going to call you all kinds of things and mischaracterize you because nobody is going to praise you for changing things because they benefit or are comfortable with things as it is. So if you're not ready to take the flack, then you ought not step out there. It goes with the territory. So we come into voting. We come into a whole fight around open housing. 64 Civil Rights Act, 68, I mean 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 open housing. Backlash. 
They start breaking up different groups. The NACP and Martin Luther King's group, SCLC, that I grew up in, and uh, Urban League, too moderate now. Labor Union, too moderate. Then they put them against the Black Power groups and the Black Panthers. They get to fight. Then you have the white left, the anti-Vietnam War activists at the time, SDS and others. They get to fight, and everybody, oh, y'all are all against each other, and they telling on you, and they doing this. And in the middle of that internal battle, all of them fighting for the same end, but arguing and fighting and, and, and getting in type of ego battles, in the middle of all of that, 68, King's dead, killed on a balcony in Memphis. Robert Kennedy dead. Anti-war movement at fever pitch, civil rights movement at fever pitch, but everybody fighting over leadership, fighting over space. And what happens in November? Richard Nixon was elected president. People talk about the 60s and forget Nixon won the election. How did Nixon win? Who had just lost in 60 for president, went home to California and lost for governor of California. So how does a man who lost his own home state come back and win because they were able to pit all of the forces against each other and the energies that they should have had concentrated toward protecting their gains, they spent those energies fighting over who's going to be the leader, which group was out front, and whose tactics were right. He won and was reelected in 72 and would have gotten through that if they didn't catch them breaking and entering in Watergate. Movement starts again, fight all the way up, start registering voters, start building on things, states' rights. We're going to change the state laws on how you can vote. And we had to go to the courts, National Union, to knock down some of the archaic state voting laws. They would do things like, yeah, you can vote. Uh, tell us how many belly, uh, uh, jelly beans in this vase. You can vote, spell anti-disestablishment terrorism backwards. You can vote state law. And the federal government, because of our fighting for voting rights, was able to supersede that. Now, you have some people that say, well, why do we have to renew our right to vote every five years? You don't renew your right to vote every five years. You have the constitutional right to vote, period. The Voting Rights Act didn't give you the right to vote. It protected you against states interfering with that. What the Voting Rights Act said in 65 was that these particular states and congressional districts, two of them in New York, have a pattern of discrimination in voting laws, like the jelly bean and all of that stuff, that they cannot change the voting laws in the state without clearing it with the national government. And that is to be renewed every five years to see if they've operated in a way that we can now say they are right. That went all the way until 2013, where the Supreme Court, I'm talking about now 2013, ruled, well, we're going to keep the Voting Rights Act where they can't change things, but we're going to take the map out, which means there's no designated states, so anybody can do it because there's no location. And the Supreme Court left the door open saying, you can come in with a new map. Congress never came back in with the new map to this day. And that is part of what needs to happen in this generation. And part of what should be in the election this year is a new map on voting rights because they have new states' rights activists. Georgia, they closed voting sites. They changed election booths. They changed certain requirements. You got to have a, a photo ID to vote in Texas that your picture's on, which eliminate a lot of people, particularly blacks, because some don't have driver's license. If you're a senior citizen, don't drive no more, you don't have a driver's license. If you're on a fixed income, you ain't traveling around the world, you don't need a passport. So how are you going to have a photo ID? So people that was voting 20, 30 years couldn't vote no more. This is right now. And there's no map. And there's no way of eliminating that. And that, again, 
Despite that, we get first black president elected, Barack Obama, getting reelected in 2012. Just like the Civil War, just like the movement against lynching, just like the Movement for Civil Rights Act, we should have expected a backlash. If you knew history, you'd say, now what's going to come after this? You got a whole generation now growing up seeing blacks in the White House as normal. Got to be backlash to that. It's the first time children, black and Latino, grew up. You have 10, 12-year-old children that never knew anybody as president but a black family. That is antithetical to a lot of people, so there had to be a backlash. And the backlash, in my judgment, is what led to Donald Trump. So if you ask yourself, how could someone so crass and unpolished and someone that is, is mean-spirited and does not have any demonstrated intellect, How could he be president is because he played into the element that has ran all the way through American history of states' rights and denying people. Because there was still that element that just needed somebody to speak for them. And when he gave a voice to that, they didn't care what he said about women. They didn't care that he said that the President of the United States wasn't a real American, which was a cold word, he's not one of us. He was born in Kenya. All of that, they understood what he was saying. That was their backlash. And what did they do? Divide the other side. So folks are saying, rather than dealing with this man's into politics talking birtherism. This man on videotape was talking about grabbing women by the genitals. This man that was advocating everything against with the movement for immigration rights, civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, all of that. They voted for him because he spoke to that element that many of them believe. And we on the other side arguing about, well, Hillary don't turn me on. <laughs> oh, I ain't going with the old school. We need new young leaders. Whether uh, I'm leaving here in a, little, in a minute or two, going back to New York, I don't care if the pilot's young or old if he can't fly the plane. <laughs> Imagine me get on the plane. No, I don't want, that guy got gray hair. I want him flying me. I want a young pilot. No, I want to get to New York. <laughs> he can be 20 or 70. Can he get this thing off the ground and safely land it in New York? When we get involved in a lot of interaction that has nothing to do with the goal, then those that have a goal are able to achieve it because they are one mind and they're focused. So I, Donald Trump is embarrassing to many Republicans, embarrassing to many evangelicals, but he achieves their goal. So how do you have evangelicals who believe in Jesus and believe in the Lord Savior Jesus Christ and coming back again, support somebody like Donald Trump because he'll put federal judges on the bench and he'll stack the Supreme Court and achieve their goal. And there's always been this battle between different, different paths in America. The state's rights, anti-black, anti-woman, anti-anybody, but white male path. And that's where you are. That's why the first thing he did was give a tax, a tax uh, cut to national corporations and to the wealthy, taking care of that crowd. First thing he did, and went on and on and on from there. And that's why he's pardoning criminals. Can you imagine he has not opened his mouth about babies in cages in Texas? Babies in cages in Texas. 
but he's been protesting all day about Roger Stone giving three years for lying to the government. And he's the head of the government. But it feeds to that crowd. So my, my real thought is that if you understand the waves of black history in Black History Month, and you understand the MO, the modus operandi of how they operate, then we ought not be divided based on anything other than how we're going to be able to stay together to keep the country on the right course. Yes, we may not agree on tactics. Yes, we may have some great young leaders and some old leaders that's been around too long or, or vice versa, but the main thing is don't let them divide. Last night I was in Las Vegas. I thought it was a fiery debate, but I hope that we don't get to arguing so much till we beat each other down so till we lose sight of what the goal is. So my message on black history is don't just study it, make some. And make some with the knowledge of the tactics they've used in the past, and therefore let us not repeat them in the present. Every generation has to make its own stand and its own representation, and the challenge is yours. And I don't care what your background is. No one in here that comes from a background that does not seem prepared to do great things, if you study our greatest activists, all of them came from backgrounds that you would expect nothing. There is no such thing as a qualification for greatness. The only qualification is that you believe you can do great things and you get up and do it. The only thing in your way is you. And if you believe it, you are not responsible for how you was born. You are not responsible for where you was born, what kind of parents you had, none of that. Nobody asked you before you got here, check off what you want, what kind of parents, what kind of socioeconomic, you didn't have a checklist. You were born, but you are responsible for what you do once you're born. And you can challenge yourself because every situation that you could tell me is a negative, I can show you somebody that was far worse that did more with it. I never knew, and I'll end on this, I know we run out of time. I never knew that I was underprivileged till I got to Brooklyn College. I went to sociology class. Sociology teacher said to me, Dr. McGuire, said we going to said to the class, we're going to study underprivileged. All right with me? So we're going to study people come out of a single parent home on welfare with food stamps and they live in multi-dwelling uh, multi buildings. I said, he talking about me. <laughs> the reason I never knew I was underprivileged is my mother never taught me I was underprivileged. My mother taught me you can be and do whatever you believe and prepare yourself to do and don't let nobody deny you. That's why, and I really end on this, that's why I was, ironically, when I got off the plane, Reagan Airport this afternoon, ran into Joe Lieberman, former, former senator. And I ran for president, Joe Lieberman was one of them running when I ran, uh, John Kerry and the others. And I remember one night we had a debate at the Fox Theater in Detroit. And I debated Joe Lieberman, Governor Graham, all of them. And when I came off the stage, a reporter came from the Detroit Free Press and said, Reverend Al, I said, yes. He said, you did pretty good tonight. I said, thank you. He said, no, I think you won the debate. I said, well, thank you. He said, you ought to be proud to be up there. So I stopped, I said, what you mean? He said, for you to hold your own with governors and senators and you don't have any of that. I said, they ought to be proud to be up there with me. <laughs> he 
said, why you say that? I said, they were all born on third base. They come from bankers and political leaders. They were born on third base and think they hit a triple. I wasn't even born in the stadium. I had to come through the bleachers and down through the seats and then run the three bases. But the fact that I had to run through more and we're on the same stage must mean I'm stronger than them and more durable than them. Because if they had to come through and I went through, they may not have made that stage. You make your stage and make your commitment and you make your history. Thank you and God bless you.